Okay. Um, so, um, I've, I've asked you to uh, go get that model and uh, the exploration of that will be a key part of today's learning. Uh, but we're going to be going back and forth uh, between that and some slides. Okay. Um, so uh, you might want to uh, follow along for both of those. So um, from this floor, um, uh, before the break, we talked a little bit about networks, the roles the networks play. Networks are a matter of connectivity, discrete connectivity, connectivity between individual entities. Um, uh, and those networks can represent very different things in practice. And indeed, the connection between two such entities can represent very different things. It could be indicative of physical proximity, where maybe one person sees another person's behavior directly and engages in imitative behavior, or maybe is transmitted pathogen by that person, breathes in aerosols from the other person. It could be indicative of some sort of social proximity that's more abstract. For example, a uh, connection on a on a online platform. Um, people who game together or connected on via Instagram or um, one person follows another on YouTube or what have you. Um, Notice it's common a variety of flavors, directed and undirected, weighted. What do I mean by a weighted network? So I guess kind there's of there's a cost between like edges. Well, yeah. between two vertices, each edge has a cost. Yeah, we might think of it as a cost. That's a common interpretation for it. Um, it is some sort of common, most commonly numeric attribute, most commonly a real number or zero or more, but uh, you know, could be could be different, and it could represent. Uh, Anything from a distance to a frequency of talking to, or, you know, close sense of a friendship, um, et cetera. Um, not all networks are symmetric. Um, there might be some where A follows B, but that doesn't mean that B follows A, right? Um, uh, and, and they exist in a variety of flavors. And uh, I, I hope to post some additional slides which talk about some of the flavors. Um, but we had also talked about some motivation for representing. In, in a word, why, what, what motivations might there be for representing that one? Why might, might we bother? We've gotten a long distance with compartmental models that don't explicitly have any networks, right? Um, what, why put in the extra detail of of explicitly representing these connections between people. Yes, uh, Justin? Well, I think it's a bit of a kind of blunt, but you know, the real answer is like, well, because networks exist in real life and if we're trying to have an accurate model, it would make sense to try to find something more accurately approximating existing reality. Okay, so, so uh, you used the key word there, which I like, which is approximating. And um, there's, there's certainly lots of things in the world that are left out of our models just as they're left out of maps. But there may be needs to effectively approximate processes in the world, to mimic them at some level, to capture the essential dynamics where networks are in fact very important. Um, anyone want to comment on? And what sort of processes they might be important for which they might be important? Yes, yeah, Brian. I think uh, when we abstract away a lot of things, sometimes we want to bring networks in because, like, say for like an SIR model, it's not just like I have an equal probability of running to into anybody in this city. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Uh, there are going to be people I am much more likely to run into. Good. And those kind of networks and relationships, as we said, networks described, help us kind of bring those things back in. Good. Um, that, that, that's right. So, so you're putting a you know finger on important part. Sometimes the network structure 
captures the essential effects of some other factors that uh, would add detail complex detail complications to a model, sometimes called detail complexity, or different from dynamic complexity. Then complexity leads to a whole greater than some of the parts. But it would add detail to the model. We we can cut through that by representing you now uh, spatial location might be might be something, or or maybe it's it's more than just some sort of static spatial relationship. Maybe it's my set of people, you know, my network connections represent people I see at different times during the day as I move in my activity space, work, home, et cetera. Um, so so network connections can capture a central degree of influence of, of one entity on another um, without the need for representing sometimes a lot of additional information. Mm -hmm. Good. Are there times where, and I'll be with you just a, a second, Mom, but uh, are there times where we might represent networks alongside spatial? Mm -hmm. um, so, so perhaps spatial factors drive what networks apply right now, who I'm connected to. The fact that I came into this classroom um, means I'm, I'm connected with you folks. Um, when I go to office hours later after class in my office, I'm connected to a different set of people, right? Sometimes spatial components drive um, those networks. Do you think networks ever determine spatial consideration? Yeah, we we might have networks of friends and we get together with those friends, right? And so, so maybe it influences our mobility. Um, and there's an interesting interplay there between, you know, details of space and, and, and other factors. But maybe just in the interest of diving into some particulars, I mean, networks represent conduits of influence. They, they can capture sort of disparities of access to different resources, social capital, like who I'm connected to, can make a big difference in opening opportunities for me. They can capture differences in perception um, between uh, one party and another, you know, things I can see, resources I can see, nearby uh, factors that I can see. Maybe if people in my social networks who have gotten COVID recently might inspire me to go uh, get get a, a vaccination. Right? Um, there's many types of dynamics that operate over networks. Um, That spread via networks that 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 have contagion over the networks, uh, and, and and capturing networks can be really important for capturing those factors. Um, uh, also, there are sometimes networks are are have very distinct structure. Like there might be clusters of people connected closely. And an infection can spread really quickly in those, or an idea really quickly. But then between areas, it takes longer. Um, I don't know, and I don't know how much time we'll to explore it, but when it comes to contagion, you know, we commonly might think of contagion moving over a network, right? Moving from one person to another, for example, right? But if you have mobility as well, movements of agents themselves, there's another way in which things can move from one person to another. And this interplay is really actually quite interesting. Like if you have mobility, infection can spread more broadly than it otherwise would. Maybe, maybe you know, think about staying at home with just a fixed set of people. If I get sick with COVID, I can spread it to the people in my apartment. And then it burns out. But if there's mobility, if one of us is going to work at McDonald's or going to, going to campus, they can bring that infection from one place to another. Or if they get on a flight, they can bring the infection from one city to another. 
a, a network theorist once commented at an event I was at that that planes are like these perfect hypodermic needles that go from like one city to another. They like they, they bundle up a whole bunch of people, some of whom may be infected, and they transport them from one context to another in another city and then let them go. And, and you can get infection spread. That's that. And um networks can also be the subject of intervention. We've talked about that before, right? Contact tracing. Um, is something which operates the networks to stop the spread of infection. Stay at home orders, right? Um, social distancing, these alter networks. But there's actually a variety of, of quite complex network interventions that you could formulate that take into account the nature of your network um, and explicitly use that information and in, in, in propagating, you know, trying to make, make a change of some sort. Um, <clears throat> And sometimes we want to understand the kind of the effects of things across networks. So, so networks have many impacts. This is from uh, TB Networks in um, Saskatchewan. We did this analysis um, last year, probably 2009 ish or so. And uh, these are clusters of sort of TB cases that are close together in in the network, so they're they're placed close together, uh, just to just to sort of group things that are tightly connected, and then you have these longer distance communities, these longer distance connections. What do you think these communities might be in our problems? Yes, cities. Yeah, there's there are cities, villages, and so on. But not their size might not be indicative of the total population, right? Um, this might be Fond du Lac in the north, this might be Black Lake, this might be, um, you know, uh, an area of uh, the south that's, that's badly hit by TV. Um, but some of them might be Regina and Saskatoon, and they are, some, some of the larger clusters are also. And then you get individuals further out for whom we don't have network. No network connections with others, and often our ability to observe networks is, is limited. So I think as computer scientists, you folks will have seen some basic definitions, right? Networks, the, the terminology differs a bit, whether you call them nodes or vertices, um, edges or arrows, but basically you have vertices and then you have edges which go between pairs of vertices, right? You comfortable with that? You probably mean a, a pair of them? And it could be directed, or in some cases, it might be um, undirected. Right? Um, and networks are, you know, often we, we seek to represent them when they're not ephemeral. They're not totally, you know, just instantaneously, constantly churning in some flux. They, they have some person. Like this network between us right now in this room proximity network, it's not permanent, right? Or we'll, we'll go off to our, our next, um, our, our next uh, encounters and what have you after this, but it persists for some period of time. And while we're here, we may be, you know, affecting each other, influencing each other, sharing ideas, et cetera, like that very sentence, right? Um, and there are other cases where, you know, we have these connections to, to others that are social networks, family networks, which may last for, for many years. Um, okay. Um, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll go light on this because I want to have some um, experimentation. But uh, I noted earlier, you know, directed and undirected wiring uh, networks. Um, uh, there are things called... Uh, multigraphs, which uh, can be distinguished from cases where any two, so if we have two nodes or two vertices, and um, and there's either zero or one connections between them, uh, that's very common. But if we can have multiple, they're called multigraphs, um, technically, in a mathematical level. Um, we can have a, a set of these that could be empty 
or it could be non-empty in a arbitrary size. Um, you can have bipartite graphs where you know those in group A, set of vertices in group A, set of vertices in group B, and the only connections you can have are from um, group A to group B and vice versa, not within each of those groups, right? Um, you can have trees which lack cycle, right? Um, and we talked about weighted uh, weighted components. And finally, there's more complex structures like multigraph or hypergraphs, which can link more than two nodes. Maybe maybe it's a tight group of people um, who who kind of um, have such a close set of relations. We we view them as all being connected to each other. Um, right. Um, so we had talked before the break about. Heterogeneity. What is what is heterogeneity again? Who can remind her? What's heterogeneity? Yeah. Yeah. Name again? Mohammed. Mohammed. Yeah. Differences? Uh, yeah. Differences between people. And one of the things we noted is that, well, we can capture some differences in um, an aggregate model, a compartmental system learning, like soft flow model. They're limited in their character to. To what? What are they limited to? Can anyone say? Um, yeah, there, they are differences. Good. good. That's absolutely right. But they are discrete differences. And, and maybe that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to pick it up. But discrete differences between people in the sense that they they fall into a couple possibilities. Whereas in age based models, we can capture Continuous differences, like my age might be continuous. Mm -hmm. uh, as a fixed thing on my height or whatever, right? Um, um, aspects of history, like birth weight. These might be continuous quantities. Like we might denote them as a real number or a non negative real number, right? Um, we can't represent that in an aggregate soft flow model. Um, and similarly, we can't really effectively represent relational quantities. And that's what networks often um, often capture, these relational quantities. So networks come in a variety of forms and so on, but, but even in the most basic form, say undirected, They, there's a set of classes of networks. Sometimes they're just occupied by, by those that differ in terms of a parameter. Other times they're sort of a class of related types of networks that are very common. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go through this now. But we're going to explore them. We're going to explore what their structure looks like. What sort of structure they define, and what sort of so what sort of dynamics they give us. Okay, so give all of you folks who are here today um, gold stuff. Um. Okay. So um, much appreciated. Much appreciated. Um. I came very close to slipping twice on the way in. If I, if I slip, it's like a kissy gap. Like, I was seriously injured. And if I fall again in the same way, I'll probably break my wrist, um, which would not be conducive to a considered class presentation. Um, uh, but um, uh, I know all of you overcame challenges as well. So let's talk about a couple types of networks. Um, the first and the most basic is something called a Poisson random network, where we have all pairs of vertices. So vertex one and vertex two, he's got right, right hand, vertex two, they're equally likely to be connected. They're connected with the same probability. 
It's this one. Bloomberg has to be here. Okay. I'd be shocked if this doesn't appear in the public. <laughs> now there's more movement of the arms and, and uh, uh, an extra level of awareness is achieved in my classes. But uh, but it's it's also very pop quizable. Um, so we have any two vertices, they have an equal probability of being connected, regardless of where they're located, regardless of any aspects of other aspects of the person. They're equally likely to be connected. Hmm? It's a very very simple connection. On the far side, there's very localized network. Where two nodes are only connected if they, for example, lie within a certain distance of each other. So logical distance or, or certain physical distance, like 2D space or 3D space. And then there's some additional types um, that have really interesting properties scale free networks. I, I spoke about them a bit last time. And what are called small world networks, which are a combination of kind of these very unstructured networks where any two nodes have equal probability of being connected and very localized networks. So we're going to go through each of these, if we may, with this model that I've asked you to download. Okay. So for those who weren't there for that, um, oh. I didn't have screen sharing on. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, that, that, well, um, good Latin phrase for it, which I almost got. Um, um, yeah. Uh, Forgetting my my Latin. Mea culpa. What's that? Mea culpa, no, not not mea culpa. It's um uh um uh, sic tempus gloria mundi. So goes the glory of the world. Um uh, um but I uh, I need to refresh my um uh, uh, ecclesiastical Latin. Um. Okay, um, so we're going to open up this model, SIRS model, ABM, and SD alternative networks. Okay, and this model has within it a an agent based model that's of foremost attention here, um, but alongside it a stock flow model, and importantly, they share the same parameter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so things like the mean recovery time or mean time to lose immunity or, or contact rate between people, um, shared between the two models, both of them more, more fundamentally, that, that was a poor flat-footed explanation, um, but more fundamentally, they share, share the same structure in terms of progression of infection and the fact that infection can spread from one person to another. So we have within our software model, susceptibles infected recover and some loss of immunity that can occur from recovered back to susceptible. And then if we were to look at agents, we would find a kind of isomorphic structure. So we have susceptibles infected to recovered, Infection transmission can undergo to bring someone from susceptible to infected. And then recovered individuals can go back to susceptible. Are we comfortable with this? So we're going to have alongside these two, these two types of models. It's actually a hybrid model, but they don't influence each other. They're they're solitude. Um, but we can they describe the same basic situation at different levels of abstraction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so so that's the basic setup. Um, we're going to go to the baseline, and and I apologize. I would like to have 
put this together in a somewhat more considered way. Um, uh, but we're going to have a closed population with no immigrants to, uh, per month. We're going to have um, 20 months uh, uh, to recover. So time units are in months. Contacts per month is going to be 10. Transmission probability per discordant contact, mm -hmm. contact and infective and, and susceptible is 0.04. Immun immunity duration will be uh, 150 months. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so what sort of dynamics would you expect? Regardless of whether it's a, an agent-based transmission or a, or a stock flow, what sort of dynamics would you expect in a model like this? Where you SIR and people who are R can lose immunity. What, what might you expect? Within within bounds of not knowing the parameters, what might be a plausible thing to expect? Yes, a fraud. No, I think so. See, at least a non zero. Yeah, well, at least a non zero equilibrium. Right. Or it's in bounds. It's the number of people getting infected per month equals the number of people recovering per month. Mm -hmm. Number of people recovering per month is equal to the waning of immunity. Number of people waning immunity per month. Uh, et cetera, yeah, the number of people in the community is equal to the number of people getting infected. You notice I'm gesturing at this aggregate, at this agent based model. And of course, this doesn't describe a count of people in the states, but you can aggregate up to that, right? And this is an important lesson. If you're simulating at a lower level, you can aggregate up to something comparable to what we might see in an aggregate model. Trying to go down from an aggregate model is more challenging. We don't have the, the resolution. So really, when I gesture at this and say the number of people recovering per month, I'm talking about counting the number of agents who undergo recovery and reasoning about that compared to the number of new infections, for example, that are occurring. Okay. Um, so it'll reach some equilibrium. Um, Good. If, if most people start susceptible and there's only like one infected initially, what do you expect to see in it? Within what what might be something you see eventually, depending what the parameters are. Give me two possibilities. What's what's one thing you might see? Yes, yes. Okay. Initial appearance of exponential growth of spread of infection. Uh, exponential growth is possible. What's also possible? Yes, you guys are completely. Dies out completely. No, it, it doesn't, it, it, you know, it falls on the sunny ground. It doesn't get to it. I neglected Malcolm. That's okay. Uh, heterogeneity was one of the questions that I had around if that networking is one of the dimensions so we could do that. It, so. it is. It is. It's, it's a type of heterogeneity that's particularly structured, but yes, that's right. That's right. We have these relational connections. Um, and a network is formed by the collective sort of um, set of those relational connections across different agents. So I might have my relational connections, you with yours, with some overlap, some of yours might be with mine, some of mine are with yours, but then there's others and we group them all together and we might get a network. We good with this? Okay, so we might see a spread of infection and then we might see it move towards an equilibrium. How might you expect this to be different? For an agent-based articulation versus a uh, stop flow. Mm -hmm. Will it be different at all? Will they be exactly the same? Yes. I can picture it being a little more erratic. Uh, okay. Because... And why erratic? Yes. Well, because they, you're not talking about a Population as a whole, like you are in a system dynamics model, you're talking about individual agents which have different probabilities of interactions. Good. Yeah. And, and, uh, EJ added to that a, a special word, which all of you should know. Okay. So, caskets is about randomness, which, yeah, correctly cited, but it's randomness over time. Okay. We know that quite, quite a bit. Some random process over time. And and that's key here because the exact timing of someone's recovery is somewhat arbitrary. If we go look at to whom a given person exposes 
others to whom they might spread the infection, they send it to a randomly connected person. The timing of their waning of immunity has some mean time, but it's actually drawn from an exponential distribution for when they actually leave, exactly at what time they will leave uh, will be drawn from this, this disease. So, the, so they're stochastics, and that will lead to kind of variability. Um, Jeff had a certain word for it, uh, but um, in, in those results. Could it lead to sometimes runs where you see very different behavior for the two? Could, could you give me a possibility of something that could happen for the agent-based model that might, for the same parameters, not happen, definitively not happen for the system dynamic model pair? Well, like um, with the system dynamics, since you have no individuality, it's always going to be the same run through every time. But with the differences in right. agents, you'll always see like slight variations. So maybe instead of taking 100 seconds to reach like yeah. in equilibrium, maybe it takes like 95 or that's right. it, it's just variances. That, that's good. That's excellent. That's exactly right. Um, so that's that's good. And those are differences in degree. Could there be a Something where you, you give a given run of it, you run it once, each one, and you, you look, the system dynamics one, as you said, will be always the same. It's deterministic. What do I mean by deterministic? Yes. There's uh no, yes. Uh 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 Danny. There's no stochastic. There's no stochastics. Yeah, it's 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 completely determined. There's no randomness and variability. It's completely dictated by the the flows dictate the updates in the stock, and the stocks dictate the value of the flows, and it just plays out in a completely reproducible, definable way. You run it a hundred times, a thousand times, you're going to get the same result for the stock flow line. You get that point? It's very important. If I run the, the ABM model, a uh, hundred times, thousand times. Might I see differences? Don't I don't see differences. Are they always only of degree, or could there be some that are very different? Right. Give me, give me an example. Could die out. Could die out. Could, die out. could be this initial person. No, the timing of this. They're sending. I'll, I'll click on that, but they're sending, you know, a certain number of contacts per day on average, but this is, or, or per month on average, but it's a rate, it's possible they'll recover before they send any. Um, or they may send all of those to a single person, maybe they infect that person, right? Also, when a person gets exposed, here, I didn't emphasize it, there's only a certain probability they'll get infected. So this random true, it flips the coin, and with a certain probability, it's true. Otherwise, it's false. It's transmission probability. So maybe they send it to a certain neighbor again and again, and none of the times does it catch possible, right? So, so there's a lot of opportunities that could actually die up. So let's go run this thing. But I want to show you in Maine, in this, in this sort of overall <coughs> environment. Um, we're going to impose different network types. So if you go to Maine and you go down to space and networks here, okay, um, there's, you can set it to use a distance-based network with a certain connection. So what this means is that if you have two nodes, V1 and V2, those nodes will be connected by, in this case, an undirected connection, meaning it, it's not pointing from D1 to V2 or V2 to V1 only. It's always both. These two will be connected if and only if they lie within this certain distance of each other. Mm -hmm. So if, if they lie further apart from that distance, they won't be connected. If they lie within that distance, they will be connected. Okay. Um, okay, and we're going to put them in space. 
I, okay, yeah, not, not outer space. We're going to put them in a space of of width a thousand and height five uh, five hundred. Visual. So what what might you expect to see from a distant space now? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, Tom. I guess you'd see like um, it would slowly expand up over time, like the closer network for what they get infected for the okay. space, but long distance would should take long. I'm assuming like it's a weighted network. But... Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, can you, you, you are a step ahead of me, but um, that's excellent. So you talking about network spread sort of localized and we're going to get there but initially i was just talking about network structure what would we see if we have any two people connected only if they log within a certain distance of each other that induces connectivity across the entire network that might look like something like that. Do, you, do you see why i say this is locally connected any so there's not a connection from like this one. Yeah, I see. For the people who are online, I'll try to point with the the pointer. Um, uh, this one to this one. Uh, there's no connection, right? It's two people are connected if and only if they lie within a certain distance of each other. Are we okay with that? Um. Okay, here's an initial person here. I don't know why this stock flow models in the middle of it. And now we're starting to see some movement. What's what's going on? Can anyone say? Like, describe how is this spreading? Yes, can the network is getting infected this time it expands so it's similar to how like the original models you have like the rings form. Yeah. In that case, it's just kind of like a ring from the network approach But it's spreading in ways that reflect the network structure and are constrained by the network structure. Do you understand? Do you appreciate that point? Um, there can be barriers, right? If, if someone is already recovered, it can't spread through them, right? Um, because they're not going to catch the infection until they, they lose their immunity. Um, whether it can jump to an area depends if there's a path, right? If there's some connectivity directly or indirectly. Do, do you understand that? And, and so you end up seeing it spreading over time. Now, meanwhile, this is a stock flow model, rather inartfully based in the middle of this. Um, and it's chunking away. Does it have that sort of localized structure in it? Not at all. Right? Any two people are equally likely to be connected within a given period of time. If I'm in, in fact, remember that contact rate, right? Uh, I have a certain contact rate with people across the network. And I don't, it's not saying the people next to me, it's people anywhere across the network, right? Um, and each of them could have connectivity across the network. If here, if I am connected with somebody, also they tend to have a lot of People in common with whom I'm connected with, right? Because we're nearby. So probably I'm connected with several other people to whom they're connected. There's a lot of spying ways in the network, and there's actually statistical methods to break this up. But you see it spreading. Meanwhile, the stock flow model is chunking away. Um, by the way, what's going on now? Why is why do we see a, a growing amount of green, which will not appear here in Saskatchewan for many, many months? Yeah, their their immunity has waned, and and now they're becoming susceptible again. And the fact that they're becoming susceptible allows what to happen? Reinfection, and so now we can get infection spreading back to areas. Okay, so here we see three outcomes in the SD model. So here's well, here's susceptible. Why does it look like that? Because what? Sorry? Yeah, everyone starts just about susceptible and and then it drops drops down and, and then um why does it go down to a low point and then go up again? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, they they start 
losing immunity, right? And and so people start coming back into the system. Initially, it's a draining out, right? Initially, no one's coming back into it. And so all it can do is go down. But then eventually the waning starts going, okay. How about infectives? This is what happens to infectives. It spreads initially in what way? Someone said it earlier. Exponential growth, right? Yeah, um, it grows exponentially, and we can actually relate it to the basic reproductive number. It actually, it actually grows at the basic reproductive number. It's uh, something like this divided by the the mean time between generations. So it's going to be ten how um associated with sort of the, the recovery time but um uh but basically it's it's growing um you know with uh you know, and so and if r not is one it's not gonna grow um uh this would be zero zero is you know, the top quiz and zero a one uh is is constant um but then it uh uh, but if, if or not is greater than the one, one person infects two, infects each of those infect two, so you get four, eight, and it all grow, right? Um, here's recovered. It shouldn't be a surprise. This is the number of infective for the ADM. Effects of an network? Good. Um, so this is this is for the SD model. This is for the ABM model. Would you say the SD model to some degree approximates the ABM? To a, to a degree, right? It's at the level of it is not entirely off, but there's a lot more variability over time, a lot more. S, tell me, stochastics in this, right? That we do. <laughs> variability, where sometimes this is higher and sometimes that's lower um, than, the, than the mean, right? Um, now, this network induces, the fact that it's a distance-based network leads to some immersion property to the network as well, including Four people in the network. So how many connect people are they connected? They're connected with all people who lie within a certain what? Distance of each other. And that induces as a emergent property some distribution, number of people to whom they're connected. Mm -hmm. Some of them happen to be in the far periphery of the network, right? They happen to be like over in this corner, or, you know, one of these folks who just happen to be in kind of an open area or what have you. And they're connected to very few, right? And then some individuals are connected with many indeed. So we have a distribution induced um, associated with that. Um, in terms of connectivity. Do people feel you have some sense of how this spreads? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like now to, so, so we've been looking at a network type where spatial location dictates connectivity. Why do I say that? Why do I say spatial location dictates connectivity? Yeah, if people lie within a certain distance, they will be connected, right? Did all of those network types that I presented earlier, did all of them have that property? I don't know if you remember, but but like like um, these, did all of them have that property? Did the first one? No, two people are connected with equal probability regardless of where they're located, right? That's a very specific property. 
this this one for distance based that one. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to explore other types of networks which have different relationships, okay? Now, the first of them is going to be very localized as well, but it's not going to be based on fiscal. It's going to be based on some sort of logical kind of thing. We're going to have these different vertices, and they're going to be numbered in a, in a fashion given by, I'm going to use terms you might have heard in math, the math, uh, discrete math, of course, um, or in 263, Z sub N. Um, but you might be familiar with it by saying it's mod N. What do we mean by mod N? So if you have N, if we have N vertices, and I'm going to number them according to this. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, okay. up to n minus one, right? Because there's zero is one. So if we only have two, it'll be zero and one, right? Mm -hmm. But it's gonna wrap around. That's why I say it's modulo. It wraps around. It's the person who's it's got number n minus one, they're connected back to zero. You get that idea? I'm gonna be connected with my neighbors in this ring, mm -hmm. this toroid, the donut. Okay, like you know, person zero and person one and two and right, um, various people, and then n minus one will be here. Now, everyone will be connected to the neighbors, like left and right. Okay, you can actually say to how many they're connected. Now, if I did this in this model, and I'm I'm go I'm going to, I'm going to engage in it in a fashion most brutal. Yeah, I bet you'd like to see that, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to set the network type to be a ring lattice network with two connections but for each agent, one to my left and one to my right. Are we okay with this idea? Are we okay with it? Change it for the whole lot. Mm. Ring lattice. Now, if you see what happens visually right now, it, you'll you'll understand why I refer to it as aesthetically brutal. Okay, um, what it lacks in aesthetics, it makes up for in computing. Um, yeah, no, it's not a very useful way of describing it. Huh? Um, Last week, um, I circulated on the MIT campus uh, um, in, in the first set of meetings, and they have brutalist architecture represented. And there's a particular subtype there, which I spent quite some time of the building of the subtype of brutalist architecture known as industrial horrible. Um, this is true. This is true. You should see these buildings. Um, and not all of the MIT campus, but those particular buildings are, are particularly horrendous uh, from a human perspective um, in sort of monolithic structures. But this is horrible in its own unique way, right? Um, just as kick happens. So with your leave, I'm going to arrange this in a nicer way. I'm, I'm not going to change the logical structure. Why does it look like that? Because it's based on logical connectivity. You can say this is zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera. It, it's not connected on based on the location in there. The location was that distance space now. You got that? Mm -hmm. This is not based on that. It's just every person has a number and it's regardless of where they're located. So I'm gonna put them in a in a in a using a visual layout that just makes clear the network structure without changing the mathematics of it. Okay. If if I were to run it that last one you would maybe maybe I'll do this just to make the point. If if I if I had this kind of cacophony and I were to run this thing here, um, well I just ran it and it it exhibited limited uh, uh, limited uh, dynamics. But um, 
uh, here. Uh, if I were to run that, it's not obvious where the infection is, et cetera, okay? Um, so what we're going to do here is, and I'm going to, um, maybe I'll make one more more run here, but um, here's like this initial person and to whom they're connected could be someone way over here. And it's not really gonna be a helpful thing for me to simulate it um, in this cacophony. So what I'm gonna do is go back to main and I'm gonna change it um, to a layout type, just changing how it displayed, not changing the mathematics. That's a ring, a ring, ladies and gentlemen like the one that I crudely drew on the board. Okay, now, if I if I were to display this, and I'll, I'll display the baseline, now what you'll see is people laid out in a, in a ring, in a torus. Um, and we'll go here and see them, see them placed on this torus. And the infection started down here, and you can see it's creeping outwards for a while. And then it, and then it died. Why do you think it died? Yes, Justin. You're very few neighbors. If your neighbor to your right has already gotten recovered, is it going to spread to your right? Even if you're infected and your neighbor to the right is already recovered, can you spread it over there to your right even further? No, it has to go through that neighbor. Right? So now that's a firewall to infect. Some relevance to damage. Um, uh, and similarly, spreading to your left. So it's very subject to being blocked. Do you get that point? No. We're doing this somewhat of a disservice because in that original histogram, if you look, the average number of people to whom they're connected in that histogram for the distance based network is about 10. Here, each person for what we just ran is connected to how many people? Oh, sorry? Two. Two. So so let's relax that a little bit if we could. Let's Let's have them be connected, not just to their two neighbors, as easy that is to think about, but to, to 10 neighbors, three to the left, three to the right. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with that? So, sorry, three. What am, what am I saying? <laughs> what am I saying? Um, five to the left, five to the right. Are we okay with that? Okay, how would you expect this will change it? It can spread further since it can buy. It has a less of a chance to get blocked by a neighbor. Good. It has five different people into it. Yeah, on each side, right? Now, do you expect it to jump around this ring? How is it spreading? How? What word would you use for how it's spreading? Sorry. Sorry. Around the ring. Okay, it spreads very incrementally, very locally, right? Not in space anymore. It's not, it's, well, we, we've sort of imposed, we've sort of imposed a visual display and it spreads sort of locally there. But what's leading to the connectivity is people's logical sort of number from zero to, to N minus one, right? Um, and you could see up here, we're comparing it to the SD model. Mm -hmm. What do you, what, can anyone comment on how, how well, how similar are, are they? Here's the SD number of infectives. Here's the number of infectives in the ABM. Yeah. Are they, is the SD model a good approximation for that? Mm -hmm. It's not. Even though we've retained to that last model, the same average number of connections per person to whom they're, they're connected. There we have a, a much better approximation of the SD model. Here, here, 
at least, or at least, it won't say it was the great approximate, it seemed to vary around it. But it was a little bit closer here, it's really quite far off. Do you see that point? And you notice it's spreading very incrementally. It did spread incrementally before, but it was in 2D space. Here, it's even more likely to be blocked, right? And you can see even by the end, it doesn't even seem that it's 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 made its way around the entire the entire space. Are we okay with that notion of a ring-based configuration? Now, this next one is really important. So this is kind of on the far side of localized, right? Distance-based is also localized with a bit more freedom because it's in two directions, kind of spread out, left, and up, down, up, down. We okay with that idea? Okay. Now we're going to go to the far side, something that's not localized at all. It's completely global. It doesn't hear at all about, about any sort of locality. What was that type of map? Anyone remember? It also goes by the name Erdos Random or Bernoulli Network. It, it goes by different names. It's a, it's a very sensible structure. So here, any two people have a certain probability of being connected. I was illustrating multigraph before, but someone's someone will be connected from oh, V1 and V2 will be connected. And the system could be to, to connection in both ways with some probability P. Okay? Uh, probability of that connection is equal to P. Okay. So now let's explore this. So let's go back to main. I'm going to go down main and we're going to keep the ring lattice layout just for 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 visual clarity uh, to prevent the cacophony. And we're going to call it a random network. And the number of connections on average between agents, we're going to use this 10 on average. We're going to retain that. Do you, you get my point? We, we saw that about the average indicated in that histogram. For a distance based network, we retained it five to left, five to right for the ring lattice. And now we're going to use it for these connections per agent for the uh for this plus on random. This P is going to be such that each person has on average 10 connections. Are we okay with that? That does mean a person can have, let's say, nine or less. Yeah, they could have nine. There might be some that only have five by chance, but but uh, on average they will they will have that. Okay, now <laughs> suddenly the ring has has a black center. Anyone want to posit why that might be? The lines are so dense. Indeed. So I'm I'm going to go back and slow this down. I want to concentrate. So so we're kind of seeing network structure. Okay. Basically, there are so many lines in there from one person to another. It's not really visible. Well, we'll deal with that in just a second. But how do you think the infection will spread? That's kind of network structure. How how will the infection spread? I mean, it'll just go along with it. It's everyone wants to have everything. It'll dump people from here and here are equally likely to be connected to them here, right? There's no notion of closeness of being sort of um, similar in position and therefore likely to be connected. Any two people are equally likely to be connected. And that's why there's this happening of connections between them. This rat's nest of connections. And so Ken posits with good reason as normal um, that the infection will be able to jump and jump the ducks and start to see this connections way across the network, right? It can leap from one to the other to the other, right? Um, like spots just going um, all across the entire network. Any two people are equally like could be connected. Now, compared to those 
types of connections we've seen thus far, the distance case, the ring ladders, how do you think this might compare to the SE model? Yeah, I'm going to do a pretty funny comparison. It's essentially the same. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty similar in the sense that any two people can connect. Um, with equal probability, it's a little bit different because here, once I'm connect, you know, that's determined up front, and I'm not connected to everyone when people like me in some churning way every every day. Instead, I'm connected with very particular people, but they can be located all across the network. And so it can hop very quickly to pretty much um, anyone, right? And indeed, if we were to run this, we would find per Ethan's, you know, postulate that we have a very close match between them. Not, not perfect. Not, again, we're not equally up what it transmitted to anyone. Um, no, no, no. But, but you know, through indirect connectivity, I might not be connected with person C. But I can connect to B, and B might connect easily to person C. And lots of my connections have a chance of connecting with person C. Very different from the distance based network or the ring lattice, where there's no way I could be quickly communicate to someone way across that state. Do you appreciate that one? Network structure dictates dynamics. We, we've said the model structure, you know, staging, what stages are, for example, the infection, the big thing, dynamic to big one. But networks have this very big impact on dynamics. They have structure themselves, and that structure induces dynamics. And sometimes it induces dynamics in a way that's very compatible with the assumptions of an aggregate model. And sometimes it's rather different. Jeff, did you appear here? Yeah, I was just going to say that if you run the Monte Carlo on the, you'll get the kind of amalgamation of the average of the real future. Yeah, and class will be going in that direction. So that's right. Now, her, yeah, so that's that's probably, maybe it's worth, worth doing right now. I mean, you'll notice there's a few times around 400, just before 600. And maybe it's, you know, eight, I don't know, 875, where this goes above that line a little bit. Let's let's run this again. And I would note for that <laughs> purpose that this is a random seed. So here we go. Let's run it. And so each time it's going to use different happenstances. To how the random number generators uh, will be will be invoked, and here we go. Okay, um, and now at those times, there's no particular, you know, privileging of those times, right? It's different times that it goes above it. It differs in its details, but it's still keeping quite close to the SD approximation, the stock flow approximation. This is a case where that, that network structure, uh, a random, ergo random net, Poisson random, or new random, let's call it random, all of, whatever you happen to call it, the random mixing, it's called approximations of an SD model, of a soft flow model, the mass action might be retained very close now. Important. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were to run it to like five, like two hundred and fifty, would you see on average that it would filter the value of the infected entity, or would it be like just slightly below? It it'll 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 be slightly below. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 In in general, uh, that's that's going to be the case. Now, if it's if you're running over very small time frames where it hasn't yet explored 
uh, been able to spread very far. It may be a little bit, it could be a little bit more distant from from it, but then uh, approach it and approach it better. You notice there is some difference in sort of how it spreads initially, how quickly it spreads, but then it it starts to uh, approximate it better. Now, per Ken's comment earlier, you notice there are some people, and maybe on average you have about 10 connections, but some people have a lot more and some people have a lot fewer. Do you see that? Um, so bear that in, in mind. Um, this probability, you know, just like if you flip a bunch of coins, sometimes some people will win, some people that will lose, some people that are born to sing the blues and, you know, that have very low connections. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, let's go to another network type of which we have been speaking. This one is going to combine the latest two. We just looked at some localized networks, right? We did distance space, we did ring lattice. Remember that? It spread slowly. And now we did this Poisson. Maybe, yeah, um, maybe uh, in the interest of time, I will jump to the small world network. Small world network. It's really interesting. As I mentioned by Duncan Watts and uh, Steve Strogatz at Cornell at the time. And, and basically, it's a weighted combination. A certain fraction of the connections are local, typically very high fraction, like 95% of my connections are local. But then a small fraction, maybe five, the other fraction, you know, the complement set, of, say 5% in that case, would be randomly selected, okay? Maybe it's 99% that are local, 1% random. How do you think, how do you think the dynamics of that would be different from a small world from a real world Yes, no? I guess you introduce some connections that are unexpected given that that layout, so maybe family, send family connections that might not be observed in the current or like whatever logical context the ring lattice is in. Okay, good. But how would it lead to dynamics? So that's true. Um, absolutely. What dynamics would be invoked? How would the dynamics differ from a ring lattice? Yes, can um, mm -hmm. would you you would kind of see like the um, localized infection spread over? You wouldn't see, I believe, that like every single neighbor decided they gets infected because like if it's on like a probability basis, it's possible that a node and its neighbor could not be connected, but another node and its neighbor is connected. That's true. So like you would kind of see like a it would be incremental, but kind of like a flickering like a Jittery incremental to go back out and in and out. And I will think. Okay, so the same idea is there. Anyone on our closet? Yes, perhaps. I don't know. So I think it's still mostly the incremental as well, but then you also have it like kind of randomly appearing in different places like that. Excellent. Yeah, it can jump to distant things because a small fraction, maybe it's 5% of my connections are with people in distant parts of the network. And that allows the sparks to not only spread locally, but to spread across there, right? And and start a fire, a conflagration in the in the distance, um, in these distant areas of the network. So what I've done is I've gone to main, I've changed the network type to be a small world network, keeping the number of connections per agent to 10. And 95% of my neighbors on average, flipping a coin, are local. The other five percent. Or distant, or or to put it this way, um, you could think of it as connecting me up with local my neighbor, you know, in a per this modulo idea. I'm connected with the five hundred stuff, and then with a certain probability, five percent probability, think flipping a coin, it will rewire the each of those to a distant one to a randomly selected. Okay, so let's let's go run this if we could. Time is short. And the snow is falling. Okay. Um, here we go. 
Why is this less dense than the last one? Can anyone say? Yes, Jeff. Because most of the connections are with very local neighbors, and all of these are going to be precisely. Most are with very local neighbors, but some of their connections are with distant ones, and we should start to see some evidence of that. Oh, have we seen some evidence of it already? What What are we seeing that we didn't see in the uh, ring line? Jump, jump, right? In a ring line, it would have started at a certain place and gone out from there. But now you see a jump over here, over there, right? Um, and the further we run it, the more we'll sort of see that that phenomenon that it's it it can jump to quite distant areas. And actually, even though only 5% of my connections are with, with different people, the dynamics that's induced looks more like one of those types of networks in the other. Oh, uh, does this look like, is this reminding more of the dynamics you saw? The difference that you saw between the ABM and SD for the ring lattice, or more, somewhat more like the rim. More like rim, it's not perfect, right? There's more variability. But it sure isn't that really low level we saw through, remember that ring lattice, it, was, it stayed really low? No, this is, this is, it's a combination, but the amazing thing is 95% of the connections are local. So you might think, oh, basically, it'd be just like a ring lattice. It'd be like 95% like a ring lattice and only 5% like the No, no, no. Those distant connections make the world a difference in the dynamic. Do you see that? Just a few network connections being distant can lead it to exhibit behavior much more similar to a, to a uh, random, uh, random network. And we could play around with that, right? Um, like how many connections need to be, um, you know, for it to, you know, if if we changed it to be 98%, what would we see? Um, and, you know, the moral of the story is um, heterogeneity, like matters. Uh, have even a small fraction of global connections make a world of difference in terms of the dynamics, right? In terms of how this infection spread. 2%, it's not like it's just 2% of the ring lat of the, that is 2% of the random plus 98% of the ring lattice result. No, 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 it's a nonlinear model. Those few connections make a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I think next time, we'll talk about the sale for you. That remaining one is a really interesting one, and one that uncannily describes many networks that we see in practice in technology, among people, among organizations, in software, many spheres of life. And it's for that task that we will press ourselves on Thursday. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming in. Your participation is noted and uh, appreciated. Thanks very much. All, all the bit, all the luck getting home safely. Be careful out there. It is really slippery. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Give, give me just a sec to stop the recording. Yeah.